One night, in an unnamed town some 70 miles from London, a heavily pregnant young woman, whose shoes were worn to tatters, was found collapsed in the street. Brought to the town's workhouse utterly exhausted, she gave birth. The patient stretched her arms out towards the child. The surgeon deposited in her arms, and she imprinted her cold white lips passionately on its forehead, passed her hands over her face, gazed wildly around, fell back and died. The surgeon leaned over the body and raised the left hand. The same old story. No wedding ring, I see. Well, good night. The baby was duly wrapped in old calico robes, which had grown yellow in such service, and given a little gruel. Badged and ticketed, he fell into his place at once, a parish child, the orphan of a workhouse, the humble, half-starved drudge to be cuffed and buffeted through the world, despised by all and pitied by none. Oliver cried lustily. If he could have known that he was an orphan, left to the tender mercies of church wardens and overseers, perhaps he would have cried louder. The parish authorities, duly, magnanimously and humanely, resolved that he should be found, dispatched to a branch workhouse some three miles off, where 20 or 30 other young juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled around the floor all day without the inconvenience of too much food or clothing and under the superintendence of an elderly female who knew what was good for children but also had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. Oliver Twist's ninth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature and decidedly small in circumference. But uh, nature or inheritance had planted a good sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. Be this as it may, it was his ninth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with two other young gentlemen who, after participating with him in a sound thrashing, had been locked up therein for atrociously presuming to be hungry. This was the situation when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the sudden apparition of Mr. Bumble, the parish beadle, held up by the difficulties of unlatching the wicked gate. Susan, take them two brats upstairs and wash them directly. My heart alive, Mr. Bumble, how glad I am to see you, surely. Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Bunn, to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate when they come here upon parochial business connected with parochial orphans? I'm sure, Mr. Bumble, that I were only telling one or two of the dear children, as they're so fond of you, that it was you were coming. Uh, well, 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 lead the way in, Mrs. Bunn, for I come on business and I have something to say. You've had a long walk, or I wouldn't mention it. Would you take a little drop or something, Mr. Bumble? Just a little drop. It's gin. What well, I keep a little of in the house to put in the blessed infant's daffy when they ain't well. Oh, you are a humane and motherly woman, Mrs. Mann. I, I shall mention that to do the board. Uh, I, uh, I drink your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann. Mm. And now, about business. That child who was half baptized as Oliver Twist is nine years old today. We have never been able to establish who was his father or what was his condition. Well, how comes he to have any name at all then? Oh, I invented it, Mrs. Mann. We name our foundlings in alphabetical order. The last was S for Swivel, and this was T for Twist. Why, you're quite a literary character, sir. Oh, I may be, Mrs. Mann, I may be. Anyway, Oliver now being too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back in the house, so I've come myself to take him there. Oliver was truly bought and trotted behind the imperious beadle 
to appear that very night before the parish board of the town workhouse. The members of the board were very sage, deep, philosophical men. They found out what ordinary people would never have discovered, that as for, poor, as for the workhouse, poor folks actually like it. No. <laughs> Said the board, looking very knowing. We are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop that in no time. With this in view, they contracted the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal. And they issued three meals of thin gruel a day with an onion twice a week and half a roll on Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations having reference to the ladies, which it is not necessary to repeat. And instead of compelling a man to support his family, they took his family away from him and made him a bachelor. It was rather expensive at first on account of the increased undertaker's bill and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which boys like Oliver were fed was a large stone hall with a copper at one end, out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose and assisted by two women, ladled the gruel at meal times. The dolls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again. Boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. One boy, who was tall for his age, got so voracious and wild with hunger that he was afraid unless he had another bowl of gruel each day, he might eat the weakly youth of tender age who slept next to him. <laughs> Lots were cast, for who should walk up to the master after supper one evening and ask for more? And the lot fell to Oliver Twist. After a very long grace had been said over very short commons, the gruel was served and consumed. The boys whispered and winked at each other. His neighbours prodded Oliver. Child as he was, desperate with hunger, reckless with misery, he rose from the table and with bowl and spoon and hand advanced to the master. Please, sir, I want some more. What? Please, sir, I want some more. The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle, pinioned his arms behind his back, and shrieked aloud for the beetle. The board was sitting in solemn conclave when the beetle rushed into the room. Mr. Lumpkins! Big pardon, sir, but Oliver Twist has asked for more. Horror on every countenance. Compose yourself, Bim Bumble, and answer me distinctly. Am I to understand that he asked for more after the supper allotted by the dietary? He did, sir. That boy will be hung, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. I know that boy will be hung. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement. Next morning, a bill was posted on the gate. A reward of five pounds will be paid to anybody, no matter who, that will take Oliver Twist to be apprenticed to any man, woman, trade, business or calling. I was never more convinced of anything in my life. That boy will be hung, repeated the gentleman in the white waistcoat. After Oliver had spent a week weeping in a dark room to which the mercy and kindness of the board had confined him, and publicly flogged as an example, a certain Mr. Gamfield, chimney sweep, came looking for a thin enough boy to fit through narrow chimney registers and spied such in Oliver. It was a dangerous and unpleasant trade. 
Several boys had died in Gamfield's care. In consideration of which the board reduced the reward paid to Gamfield to three pounds fifteen. <laughs> Oliver was duly taken to the magistrate to have his apprenticeship in dentures signed. Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver to look very happy. But when the elderly magistrate looked around for the ink pot, his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who despite Bumble's frowns and pinches, was looking at his future master's repulsive countenance with such horror and fear that even a half-blind magistrate was moved to ask, <laughs> What is the matter, boy? Oliver fell to his knees and clasping his hands together, prayed that they would send him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. We, we, we refuse to sanction these indentures. Take the boy back to the workhouse. Treat him kindly. He seems to need it. The next morning, the public were once more informed that Oliver Twist was again to let and that five pounds would be paid to anyone who would take possession of them.